Hey there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time it might be in your part of the world, welcome back to the live stream. This is another C Sharp with C Sharp Freights. How you doing out there, chat room? How's it going? It, it, it's it's sunny. It's beautiful here in Philadelphia. I, I might have had a, a little bit of extra sun just a bit. I, I look like the Phantom of the Sunburn Opera. How you doing there? It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for coming back. It's been a while since we've been able to get together. I've had I've had a number of things pop up here in September at the end of August. I'm back. We're going to be doing um, it, we're going to be doing a couple weeks straight here of streaming. It's so good to be back with you, and thank you so much for tuning in. Let me head over. Let me say hello to the folks in the chat room. They're uh, they're right over here. My goodness. So many folks tuned in on both YouTube and Twitch today. If you're watching on YouTube, on youtube.com slash dot net. Over on Twitch, on twitch.tv slash visual studio. Let me say hello to Martin is here from the UK. Uh, excuse me, is that Renan from Brazil? Uh, Lava Kumar, hello to you. Rizwan is here from Pakistan. Serge, how you doing over there on Twitch? David Masterson, bonjour to you in France. Tiger Pleb, how's it going over there on Twitch? Badger23, greetings to you. Anthony, hello to you over there on YouTube. Dialed in from South Africa, hello, hello. Robert is coming in from the mystical, wonderful land of Cincinnati. I am so sorry that your, your cross-state rivals, those Cleveland Guardians, made the playoffs, won their division, and, and the Reds, you're going to have to try again. So, uh, how you doing there? Uh, T0FY is here from Pakistan. Uh, Heiko Werner is here from Kiel, Germany. Good Nachmittag, sir. Good to see you. Uh, M. Brownwart, how you doing on Twitch? Joshua is here. Uh, yes, from Malawi. Lovely coders. I hope we're all lovely coders here. How you doing there, digital dummy? Chris Jones, good to see you. Um, we've got another hexadecimal developer here from rainy Germany. Two Fox, seven Charlie, three seven. Hello, hello. Horace Burry, how you doing there in London? Anem Yellow is on Twitch and dialed in from Denmark. Good to see you. Sound of Heaven Studio is here from the Netherlands. How you doing there, Smab, over there on Twitch? Uh, Kalash is here from India. Pro Programming from Pakistan. Yes, the re the the Reds the, the Reds are a tragic mess, and and my Philadelphia Phillies are not much better. Stumbling as we get to the end here. Um, my goodness. How you doing there? Cesar is here from Haiti. Abishak, how you doing there in India? Hugo from Norway. Camerons is here from Sweden. Mahesh from India. How you doing there? Uh, Luthvi from Indonesia. Uh, Diako from Kurdistan. How you doing there? Furkan from Pakistan. Baki from Algeria. How you doing there? Um, Mazdan from Italy. How's it going there? Rodrigo, uh, any chance we can add some time to learn how to add multiple columns for where filtering to a query on runtime using EF6? How to add multiple columns for where? You're just doing another and clause inside your where, your where, uh, statement. It's not hard. Just where, and you have your first item, and you put... Um, double ampersand and go on to your next uh, because if you want to and things together if you want to or double vertical pipe just like you would any other C sharp statements and it will put those logical statements together before I go to more greetings let me get some music playing here in the background um, I'm going to go with the lo-fi playlist today from stream beats stream beats of course is music that you can listen to that is royalty free DMCA free you can use it wherever you want whether it's Twitch YouTube Facebook doesn't matter. Check it out from streambeats.com. There's playlists for Apple Music, Amazon Music, or even Spotify, like I'm listening to here. And this is the lo-fi playlist. Nice groovy music that's just going to be quiet and in the background. There we go. Almost too quiet. Can we get it? Can I get a little more of there for me? Um, and, uh, Big thanks to Harris Heller and his team of creators for putting this music together for us to listen to today. So, yeah, Rodrigo, you're just going to be looking at putting together um, some very simple additional clauses in your where statement. Um, not, not too hard to do. It should just interpret and add those additional column checks that you're looking for. 
Uh, is that Vanugapal? How you doing there in Hyderabad in India? How you doing? Warning GX from Turkey. How's it going? Martin is here from the Czech Republic. Greetings to you, Martin. Last time I was in the Czech Republic, I, I visited Brno. Such a fun city to visit. Uh, Tuk is here from Vietnam. Uh, Cameron's asked, will I stream any Blazor content in the near future? Um, we're always streaming Blazor content over on my personal channel, C Sharp Fritz on Twitch. Um, always talking about Blazor over there. We're going to be talking about Maui is going to be the next topic we get into. We're going to do a wrap-up stream next week. Wrap up the collection website. I've got a bunch of features that, that didn't quite finish during various streams. I want to recap those various things. And, and wrap that up and have a nice template website ready for you to go at the end of next week's stream. Then we're going to get in. We're going to do a bunch of Maui. We're going to talk about Blazor as part of that. And um, we'll, we probably will get back into Blazor in the new year uh, on the other side of .NET 7. Am I starting from scratch or do we already have a project? Asked Diaco. We already have a project. I can show you what it looks like in the from scratch template, but we already have a project for today's session. How you doing there? Navi on Twitch is here from dialed in from Turkey. Um, so it, it, this is an application that we have built from scratch. You can go back and watch the other videos in the series to see how we've built it. Strug says hello to everybody uh, dialed in from Russia. Strug, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe to the folks, to, to the people of Russia. I hope you're doing well there. Um, we're not too thrilled with what your government's been doing recently. Um, as as a, a person of Ukrainian heritage, um, very disappointed in the, the Russian leadership. Hope we're, <clears throat> we're, we're seeing a turn there for, for the better. Yes, Camerons, we, we're always talking about Blazer over on my personal channel. Uh, M. Brownwart with a couple of uh, a couple of steins of beer there, it looks like. Hello. Rodrigo uh, follows up with the question, depends on a simple query for the same endpoint, I need to add some wares if a column is not null, so it's very dynamic. Well, before you execute your query, you can concatenate on <clears throat> additional where clauses. We've done this with the ClipTalk application, where folks have an advanced query grid, right? You have a, a grid that says, well, I want to add these other conditions optionally. Um, filter by videos that were created between these dates on these channels, um, have these topics. And we, we dynamically add on where statements. Save off your link statement and dynamically decide to add another where clause to it. Just put a dot where on the end of it and it will automatically concatenate those together. Um, drop me a line on Twitter and, and I can put together a quick demo to share for you. Um, Baki asks, uh, can I use Maui like WPF MVVM for a desktop app? Sure. Absolutely. Hello to Valter on YouTube. Um, Vanugapal on YouTube asks any content over Azure AD authentication and authorization using Azure identity. So there, um, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not going to dive in to all the specific ways that you can authenticate. There are so many different ways that you can authenticate. It is crazy. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you where you can get the configuration information to add in for, for Azure, for different things. And we're going to use the default local database that stores all of your, uh, user information. Um, but certainly using tools like OAuth, OpenID, <clears throat> these are going to get, allow you to hand off authentication to somewhere else. The authorization capabilities, we're going to make sure that you see how to do that, how to configure policies, how to, and a technique that I like to use where I like to move my policies into another file. And um, we're going to see a little bit of that today because it, authentication is its own kettle of fish. Authorization is really the piece that for us as developers, once you get past getting authentication configured, you're done. You don't need to go and do more with that. But authorization is where you're going to see changes in actual um, investment in your development throughout your application. Any suggestions for Maui on Linux machines? There, there, there's a team that's been building a runtime, um, an open source team, a community team, building a runtime for Maui on Linux. However, if you need production support, if you need that right now, I suggest check out friends like Avalonia 
and uh, the Uno framework. Um, what's my what's the channel on YouTube? The channel on YouTube is .net. Hola to you, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel in Puerto Rico. See, depending on what part of the world you're from, it's Gabriel. Gabriel, different. Diaco is uh, asks, does the auth cookie no longer be valid if the application restarts? Uh, if the application restarts, it will continue to be valid. Um, it will still be able to be uh, reused. Which episode to look for? L the the last eight episode. Oh wait, the which episode to look for for the dynamic wares? Uh, no, I, those episodes aren't posted. I, I can get you some source code to show you that. Hello to Namso in, in Nigeria. Brother, can we get to a point? Yes, in about 30 minutes more of AMA. Look at all the questions coming in. Do you want me to just ignore people? I can ignore your comment. That's why we put a timer here so that we have it time box. This is how long we're going to AMA. This is how long we're going to go through and answer questions from folks and talk through different things that are going on. Anna is here from Montreal. Um, you're welcome, Rodrigo. Good luck. Vinay is here from India. Hello to you. Uh, Carlos from Chile. How's it going there? Fabio from Italy. Welcome in. It's, it's kind of important to me to kind of box this, right? And I do realize there are folks that are looking for videos like this and, and look at videos like this and they're like, oh, this isn't, this is an authoritative uh, piece of documentation. No, this isn't. This is a teaching, this is a teaching video where we're teaching, teaching and answering questions. That, that's sometimes a bit more viable than a static video just sitting there that says, here's how you do the thing. Because be besides just, here's how you do the thing, there's always questions. There's always the steps around that. There's the, well, what are the errors? How do I handle those errors? How do I do the other things? Where do I go to learn more information? Answering those questions and, and dialing them in and getting you, specifically you, the, the support and the, the questions you need answered, it's a pretty good thing. And we can't do that in two minutes on a TikTok video. I can create a dozen TikTok videos and stitch them together, but why? Now you've done the same thing as a YouTube video that's 20 minutes long. Go to the right place for the right content. So, um, hello to, uh, is that, is that Kong, Kong from Myanmar? Hello. Um, Olale, how you doing in Nigeria? Uh, is it Teus in Australia? How you doing there? Diaco asks, when to use Java... The, the JWTs, the, the, right? The JavaScript web tokens over cookies. Um, when you're working with APIs, even then, you can still use cookies to connect to APIs. Um, but if you're op exposing an, a, an API and you don't really have a front end to it, use a JWT at that point, the JWT. How you doing there, Golden Game Studio in Nigeria? Good to see you. Rizwan asks, are there any plans to go over GraphQL in the near future? I didn't have it on the and on an agenda. Um, I touched. I think I touched briefly on. Did I touch on GraphQL when we did APIs? Um, it's something that that. Oh gosh, we can definitely talk about GraphQL. Um, GraphQL is it, it, exposing GraphQL endpoints is is interesting compelling allows for a lot of flexibility for people to be able to query your database however we run into the same issue we had with odata you've openly exposed your database you need to now put constraints on it otherwise because you've exposed your database you've actually opened yourself up to significant data issues say so people are able to query and interact with your database in ways that you don't have control over that's a problem your database administrator is not going to like you about with that you can do it you're going to need to want to put some constraints and configure it and be aggressive around that configuration to make sure that you you don't inadvertently allow folks to to create queries that are going to crush your database so yes you wouldn't like going to school and not being able to answer a question let me get the gunner glasses on here so i'm uh, feeling good and have my computer vision glasses ready to go. 
Um, and I, I wear these because I, I have, I have eye problems. I wear uh, bifocals. My eye doctor recommended that I wear uh, blue light glasses to help with, when I'm doing long, long sessions of computing. Um, will I be explaining? Prototype Fanch asks, will I be explaining authentication and authorization through the front end or through the API? I don't know what you're asking there. I'm not sure what you're looking for. We, we have an existing application. We're going to add authentication and authorization to it. And we're going to light up and see how it's used, how it log, how you can log in. We're even going to add a GitHub provider and we're going to let you, um, and we're going to configure a policy to verify that folks are able to do things in the application. So we're using the API. We're also looking at how the user interface works. So it is a two-way conversation. And that's the point of these sessions. If I wanted to do just a demo, here's how you do authentication. I wouldn't dedicate two hours to, to a stream and spend hours ahead of time preparing demos and, and tuning and practicing. I, I would just record it and be done with it and you wouldn't see this. So that's that's kind of the point. That's that's what makes this so exciting and interesting. Hello to you, Charlie in Mexico. Good to see you. Camerons, thank you so much. I'm glad you appreciate it. Uh, it is that Dimitro? Hello to you in Ukraine. Hope you're staying safe. Hope you're staying well there. Uh, it, is it Yasin in Morocco? Hello. Anthony is here from India. You want to learn Blazor? Check out the previous videos in the playlist. <clears throat> C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz on the .NET channel. Um, and I've also got a bunch of um, intro to Blazor videos on YouTube on the .NET channel that you can check out as well. Um, and there's a, a Connect 4 demo that I wrote with Blazor that I need to finish recording that video for YouTube, get that published. But it's coming. Hello to you, Marcos in Brazil. Good to see you. Oh, literally, I have probably about two dozen videos just about getting started with Blazor here, as well as an eight-hour workshop that you can check out. I have a 12-hour one that we recorded in July that I need to finish breaking down. It literally, YouTube won't accept me uploading it. I need to finish breaking it down and get it uploaded as a playlist on my channel. Um, is it Kevin in Paris? Good to see you. Air, energy, air conditioning, and heating. Good to see you in Houston. Sunil is here from Nepal. Gonzalo in Mexico. How you doing there? Um, David asks, as soon as it's out there, out there, you're in bed. Dude, I don't. Okay. Amir, why are your comments not showing up? I don't know, Amir. Why aren't your comments showing up? Um, because I sure see them, Amir. Uh, David asks about refresh tokens and cancel tokens. Yeah, that's a that's a jot discussion. We're not going. We're not going to be going there. Atale asks, is it hard to begin Docker? Where should I begin first? Docker is not hard. You need to think about Docker as you're building a uh, you're building an install script for a brand new machine. Docker containers can be are defined as images, and an image is like a cookie cutter. It's like a stamp. You can create many copies of that, and those little container virtual machines are running around on wherever it is you told them to run, on your local machine, somewhere on the cloud, in a Kubernetes cluster. So once you understand the difference between a container and an image, now you need to write a script to generate that image that you'll use to stamp out your containers. And the language for building an image is, is not hard to learn. It's, it, it's a little bit different from other things, but when you read through it, it reads almost like a, a shell script. Like you might write for PowerShell or Bash or Z shell, whatever it might be, whatever shell you enjoy using. It, it reads like that. And you'll see statements from some other base image, uh, copy in certain files, um, the ports to expose, run this application. It's very clear and it, it reads like a script. So where would I go to get started? There's a handful of courses on learn.microsoft.com uh, to help you get started with Docker, and they'll show you how to use Visual Studio Code so that you can be successful with that. Best of luck to you at, uh, is it Adelaide Elmas on YouTube. 
Diaco asks, does identity have any limitation? Why people use third party authentication services? Um, people use third party authentication services because they want to offload some of that capability, some of that configuration to somewhere else, to OAuth. Uh, I'm sorry, to Auth0 or services like that, where they'll take care of that configuration. They go have, work through and, and manage that, and you can put all of your configuration there. You can also do it with Azure Active Directory. You can register providers to go through there and get you logged in. So there's, there's options for you there to basically move your abstraction over your identity providers. You want people to be able to log in with, with things like GitHub or their Google accounts so that they log in with YouTube. You want people to log in maybe with their Twitch account or their Yahoo account. Do people still log in with a Yahoo account? Their LinkedIn account, whatever it might be. You want people to be able to log in and use those accounts so they you offload it to some of these services where folks already have accounts. So. Um, how you doing there, Sircon? A numb yellow says use Flux for blue light. See, that changes the light on your monitor. Now you now your eyes are doing weird things because you're looking away and the blue light is still coming in from other places. I'm completely shielded from blue light because of how these go all the way around. How you doing there, Tiger Pleb? You say after this series, I'm going to start a Maui app. Yeah, we're going to do a Maui app. It'll be um, second week of October. We'll start on a Maui application. Um, using Duende or the built-in Identity DB context. Yes, we're going to be using uh, Identity DB. We're not going to get into Duende or Identity Server, any of that information, any of that stuff. That's a whole other topic that folks on the 425 show do a much better job covering um, because that's what they do. Um, will I cover multi-factor authentication today like Office 365? Um, I'll show you how you can turn on two-factor authentication for an ASP.NET Core application. Um, and I'll show you how you can do... We're going to let you log in with GitHub today as well. Um, Gabriel asking, any good videos on developing for Blazor server with some code isolation? Um, tutorials you've seen on YouTube have all the logic from validation to data access on the same file. Well, you can separate those at any time. Um, you just name them the same thing, just dot CS and you make it a class behind the scene. Um, let me know a little bit more what you're looking for because we're building, recording and working on Blazor content. Um, certainly we have to update it for .NET 7. So drop me a line on Twitter. Let me know what you're looking for and I will follow up. Um, Yasin asks, what is my opinion for .NET MAUI with hybrid Blazor? I think it's fantastic because it means that web developers can build an application that runs everywhere, runs on a cloud server, runs in a browser, natively in a browser, and runs natively on your favorite operating system, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. Um, same code run, just runs everywhere. With hybrid Blazor, you put the wrapper around it and you're in great shape. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity for web developers to be able to share that that portable application. Um, Search says at, at work using GraphQL for equivalence in big data, it's great as a supplementary tool database. Okay, cool. Um, Athila, how you doing there in Brazil? Uh, Wolfchen, how you doing? Uh, guten Nachmittag to you in Germany. Uh, Hoya in Korea. Hello, good evening to you. Um, you're under disguise today. Shh, don't tell anyone. Uh, hello to Brian in Mississippi. Charles Ritchie is here from Kentucky. Good to see you. Eduardo in Mozambique. How you doing there? How's it going? Napalm. Good to see you. Um, any suggestions? Lavar, Lava Kumar asks, on a learning path for Roslyn with C Sharp for runtime compilation and adding executed methods to the program. So you're trying to dynamically compile code and add it into your application. Um for a learning path to do that dynamic compilation as an application is running so you're you, you want to you want to allow people to write code and execute it inside your application um i don't have any place off the top of my head i can look for something and get you pointed in the right direction afterwards drop me a line on twitter and i i will follow up on that 
um, the learn topics, the learn courses that we have, don't go deep on Roslyn uh, advanced features. But you're going to be, you're, uh, yeah. I, I don't want to say anything more because I'm, I'm not 100% positive how to do it. I've tinkered with that in the past, but I, I forget how to do it and I'm, I, I don't want to misspeak here. Drop me a line and I, I will get some information for you. How you doing there? Visual Academy in Korea. Good to see you. Yuri asks, do I think Blazor is somehow dying? What? You haven't seen too many updates on .NET 7 related to it. Um, .NET 7 is primarily a performance and, and capabilities uh, uh, and a hardening of capabilities release. You're seeing improved performance, improved um, improved reliability coming with Blazor on .NET 7. It is not dying in the least. No, 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 no. Um, what you're what you're seeing is um, the team was focused and, and spent the first half of the year where they would have been working on .NET 7. They spent the first half of the year getting it into .NET Maui, getting it working and compatible over there. So it's not dying. It's, it's actually expanding beyond server and WebAssembly and into .NET Maui. So that's where you're seeing it growing and, and going to. And you're going to see a whole lot more with that. Uh, Kong asks, um, can I use Maui on Blazor Spa? It's the other way around. You can't use Maui in a single page web application. You put a single page application inside of a .NET Maui app. .NET Maui is the framework that lets your application run natively on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. So it's it's just the other way around, Quang. So, how you doing there? Is that Quak An Lee? How you doing in Vietnam? Atal, hello to you in Delhi. Which server provider am I planning to use for authentication? I'm I'm doing the local database authentication. I'm going to add in uh, GitHub authentication on that. Um, Okta has a good example as well. Yeah, they, they're other providers that you can add in. Yahoo accounts in 2022, right? Is that still a thing? I don't know. Yahoo would probably say it is, but I don't think they have a significant portion of the uh, internet mind share right now. Luthvi asks, is there .NET publishing WebAssembly as a function that JavaScript could access instead of publishing WebAssembly as a whole web application? That's coming in .NET 7. Being able to publish a, a bit of .NET code that you can load up and execute. Check out the RC1 um, blog post from my friend Daniel Roth over on the Microsoft blog. There's information about how to do that so that you can start up, reach into the .NET runtime in WebAssembly from Angular, Vue, React, your favorite JavaScript framework, just vanilla JavaScript as well. Reach in, call some of those methods, and reuse them. So um, that is absolutely coming with .NET 7. There were ways to do it with .NET 6. It's even easier with .NET 7. WQ Walter, how you doing there, Walter, over on Twitch? If you deploy an, an MVC application to Azure, how do you add two-phase authentication? Not two-phase, two-factor authentication to the app. Two-factor authentication to the application. Is it built in or an added service? It's built in. Um, there's a there's actually an option to add it when you scaffold content. Um, I can show you that when we get into uh, into our demo. How you doing there, Sachin? Good to see you. David says my glasses are still clear with blue light protection on it. The sales folks must have seen me coming for the yellow shade. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. Um, it, trust me, it, it it feels right. Um, all right, let me see here. Do I think Identity Server 4 is still valid in 2022? Yes. The, it's become so popular that... The folks that maintain it need to get paid. They, they were spending so much time working on it that they need to get paid. They, they, they it, it became their job, and everybody using it for free, and and them doing all this work maintaining it. Folks need to get paid for the things they deliver. So, um, I think it's very valid. 
And if if you don't want to pay for an authentication service like that, you can use Azure Active Directory in the first, what is it, half million objects that you, that you store in Azure Active Directory free. And all the framework is there inside ASP.NET Core to work with it. So check that out if you if you don't want to uh, use Identity Server because the folks there have moved to a dual license um, with commercial options. Um, Wolfian asks, are there differences in authentication authorization between .NET 6 and 7? I haven't, I haven't explored .NET 7 yet. The changes that I'm seeing for .NET 7 as I go through and learn it, um, not something that, that it's not something that's been changed it, from what I've seen so far. I, I still need to go through and finish reading. Um, Tiger asks, um, I thought you already covered authentication authorization topic. I cover it with each framework to show just how it's different with each one of the frameworks. Folks want to know that and, and see that with their framework that they're learning. So I spend an, an episode covering it each time. It is a, a cross-cutting concern. A lot of what we're seeing is the same, but when you get, do get into the framework-specific things, it is a little bit different. James Foreman loves Blazor. No more jQuery. <laughs> <laughs> um, nothing wrong with jQuery. Nothing wrong at all. Um, jQuery, fantastic framework that, that got everybody excited about doing more JavaScript. If yellow lenses are good enough for Bono, then they're good enough for Fritz. <laughs> um, he has, he, he has uh, damage to his eyes uh, where he does, he does have to wear uh, yellow lenses all the time. Um, Jason, how you doing there? Asking, is it really true you can only have 10 people instances uh, at the same time on a Blazor server app if you deploy to IIS server? No, that's not. No. Um, there is... Okay, now... Um, Blazor server capacity. When we ran the, the Blazor server capacity... Um, tests way back in .NET 3. Using Blazor Server at scale, using a standard D1 V2 instance on Azure, we could handle over 5,000 concurrent users without any degradation in latency. I'm going to grab this link and share it out to both servers. There you go. Um, so... Learn ASP.NET asks, off topic, do I have a database and code sample where you can make product variance Cartesian? What? Two types products? No, I don't. No. At that point, you're you're going down into building, an, building a full product. You go build that product. I've showed you how to how to how to put an item out there. How to we've seen storefronts, there's samples out there that show you how to build an application. You go build that. Um, yeah, if someone says that you can only have 10 users, you're pro do probably doing something wrong. Uh, no, that absolutely not in the Microsoft documentation. No. Um, no JavaScript, just WebAssembly is the perfect solution, says Browaris. It's going in that direction. I strongly believe that folks will be talking WebAssembly first before 2025. Um, because there's lots of programming languages out there that people prefer over JavaScript. You've had issues regarding memory consumption. Um, take a look at some of the articles about Blazor server and memory use. It's very easy to create a, a memory leak scenario in Blazor server if you aren't disposing of your objects properly. Sokar asking, any way to pre-compile strings when running in a bunch of different databases, some formula... Um, Entity Framework 6 has a pre-compile option that you can take a look at, a, a, a code generation option that you can use. Take a look at that. That'll probably get you somewhere in that direction you're looking for. Hey, Johnny B. Cat, good morning. How, how's it going, Ancient Coder? Good to see you. .NET MAUI deployment, not covering that today, sorry. 
Uh, Magic Mo on Twitch asks, I don't know if this is the right place to ask. Well, let's give it a shot. Let's see what we got here. See, see, here's the AMA. Folks were saying earlier, when are you going to get to this stuff? In about six minutes. But this is the AMA. This is the Ask Me Anything. You started the ASP.NET Core app workshop on GitHub. That's a little bit older. But you couldn't complete it because the authentication authorization example for .NET 6 is missing. Uh, yes, that workshop needs to be updated. It does. Um, drop me a line on Twitter and, and I will get you connected with some folks and we'll see about um, getting that addressed. Um, but drop me a line on Twitter. I am C Sharp Fritz on Twitter. Uh, Luthfi, glad to see that coming because we need to enhance legacy service with WebAssembly. It, it's That's my forecast that WebAssembly is going to take over because whether it's Go, it's Rust, it's the .NET languages, it's Java, um, folks prefer other languages instead of JavaScript for many, many different reasons. Um, having, having compilers, have static type analysis, having... Um, the various tools for, for unit testing built in, um, productivity libraries, a vast ecosystem that is checked and supported it means a lot to folks. So how can you get this recording? Come back in about, in about an hour and a half and it'll be here on the .NET website. PHP to WebAssembly converter. Yep, there's a PHP to WebAssembly converter. Uh, compiler. But yes. How you doing there, Carlos in Brazil? Uh, FIFA World Cup is coming up, right? In two, three months. I'm feeling pretty pretty strong about our American our American side this year. Uh, the American team is is looking pretty strong. But see, we're gonna we're gonna even if we go three and zero in in the uh, preliminary round. We're going to run into Brazil like we do in the second round, second or third round. Every time we, we get out of the preliminaries, the round robin, we get into the knockout phase. We run face first into Brazil and Brazil just demolishes the Americans. Like we can't even get out of North and South America. We run into Brazil and, and the folks of Brazil. Fantastic footballers. Always. Just, ah, oh, ah. Oh. <laughs> it's going to be. It's going to be so exciting for American American soccer, American football, and we're going to run into Brazil again. That's just the way it is. Like, ah, <laughs> uh, but it'll be fun. Uh, looking forward to spending some time with all of you out there talking about the 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 big football tournament, the soccer tournament coming up in in December. Uh, right, December, end of November, beginning of December. Yeah, yeah. Browaris uh, says modern browsers should have UI frameworks that are native calls and look the same on all platforms with usage of any language. Um, no, that's called a monopoly, and the legal system has ruled that illegal. Sorry, that's never going to happen. Otherwise, Google would have put Angular into Chrome. Uh, no, not happening. Um, it's great to have ready-to-use packages for SSO, OAuth, push, files management. Yes, absolutely. Noise indeed, Big Linter. Good to see you. Hooligan495 is building a new UI Windows application, trying to figure out when to use WPF versus WinUI. Uh, neither. Um, use .NET MAUI. .NET MAUI is our recommended way to go. If you use WinUI directly, you're tightly coupled to Windows. You're not going to have any options to move forward with other technologies. If you use .NET MAUI, you have an abstraction over WinUI. And then, and then when Skippy, the next aisle over, says, hey, this doesn't work on my Mac. Because you build it with .NET MAUI, you can recompile for the Mac with just a little bit of work. And now your application runs on Mac. So um, WPF is still, is still being maintained. It's still receiving features. WinUI is the preferred platform that the Windows team wants you to develop with. .NET MAUI is an evolution of Xamarin Forms that targets WinUI for Windows. Um, Tiger Pleb asks, can I quickly explain the real authentication um, benefit? I don't know what you're asking for. Uh, yes, the humans, US women's team always does better. They, they, they're pretty good. The American women, they're pretty good. Um, poor Greece, they've hit brick walls over and over again. And yeah, they have. Um, don't give them ideas. 
Carlos says, ah, I don't know. Let's see our guys this year. I I agree, Carlos. Uh, I haven't seen much about the Brazilian side. I'm I'm sure they're always strong. Oh, my goodness. You're constrained to Windows OS for a medical device. Um, I would still look at, I would still look at .NET Maui, and and not code directly against WinUI. I think you're you're. At some point, you, you're you may even get folks say, "Well, I want to be able to use this on my iOS or Android tablet." It, it's a little bit of future proofing is where I why I would consider that. So. Brawaris asks, just wonder what will replace MVC. Well, MVC is an architecture pattern. So I don't think not some, anything's going to replace it per se, but it's definitely going to, um, it, it's definitely something that, that we, we shift folks towards Razor Pages or even Blazor for ASP.NET development. We think there's a, a better, more productive experience there. However, if you want to be hands-on, all the way down to the metal and have full control over everything. MVC is very good for there. What's my favorite band? Oh gosh. Um, right now, see, a couple of years ago, I would say, "Oh my gosh, I really enjoyed Daft Punk," and and I was a big fan of Breaking Benjamin before that, and and Metallica will always have a place in my heart. So my favorite band right now is Hard. Hard to put a finger on. Pink Floyd, it, yes, back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, I was definitely a Pink Floyd person. Absolutely. So, um, but I, I, I do love a, a more uh, a, a more raw guitar sound. Um, Foo Fighters in, in the late 90s, I was very into. So, Napalm kind of loves ASP.NET MVC. Would be very disappointed. No, they're not axing it. No, no, no. Mm-mm. No, no, no. Um, it's a question of where do folks get steered towards. MVC is now where API development is. MVC is very much the the base framework that everything else kind of ends up building on top of. Um, where let's get ready here to go get started here. But Oratachi says, "Bit of a shout out. Thank you for continued hard work on the content." Thank you, Oritachi. Thank you. Very much appreciate that. Um, let's get ready to, to talk about what we're going to do here for authentication and authorization. We've been building this collection website. It's a bit of a generic topic of uh, collections, right? We've all got some sort of collection out there. I have a collection of hats, but you might collect coins or stamps or comic books or movie posters or whatever it is that you might collect. Maybe you collect albums from your favorite band, whatever it is. And you want to be able to show them off, right? And, and sure, you can put photos up on, on Facebook or on Instagram and here they're all categorized and, and there they are on that social media. But you don't really have ways to interact with it. it and okay, it's kind of nice. It's on that platform over there. But what if you wanted to build a website to manage and show that off? And that's what we've been doing is building this collection website so that you can show off your your collection. And we're learning ASP.NET MVC along the way. Now, we've built all of this without any security in mind, so anybody can just add, edit, or delete content, and anybody can just browse through and, and see the application. So, what if we want to start constraining that? We want to take a little bit of control over who can interact with and, and add items to the application. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to add authentication, and we're going to add authorization. Authentication is identifying who is interacting with our application. And this isn't this isn't a privacy thing, but I need to know who is logged in and what and, and, and so I can determine are you allowed to do these things? That's the other part. Authentication, who is logged in? Get connecting that to an identity that we can then grant access to. And that access is delivered through authorization. So the authorization says, are these folks, is this identity, this person who's logged in, are they allowed to do these things? And it could also be a service account of machine. But um, that's the difference between authentication 
and authorization. I see a question there. Hey, is the source code available so we can follow along? Yes. Let me get you over to the GitHub account. It should have. Mm. Um, if if you are on YouTube, yeah, um, you can go to the link just below the video. In fact, I'm looking here. Yeah, there's a link just below the video. It says community links on YouTube. Click that. It'll take you right through to the application over on Twitch. Um, yeah, there's the link in chat so you can go navigate to that. Um, if you go under sessions, season two, collection website. So if you go all the way down to here, those are the sessions where we're talking about the site. Um, there is a branch 1209 that you can click through and see that, um, is where we're going to be. It's already got the demos written that I'm going to show today, just in case I need to fall back and it doesn't work. I can refer back to my committed branch of code. See what I did there? I write the code ahead of time just in case it doesn't work and, and I can revert. I've already got it sitting there waiting for me. Um, but let's, let's get into this. Talk about the topic. I've got some links for you back to the documentation. And how we doing? That's a little quiet. Can I get a little more? Can I get a little more heat coming through on that? Test. That's better. Um, so we'll, we'll show you where the documentation is because everybody's got something different that they're doing as far as setting up authentication. I want to make sure you know where to go to get more of that information to get your application set up. So let's cover the coffee here. Grab the phone. So I've got my timer in front of me. Uh, yes, I've got my timer in front of me so I can see what time it is. Um, what? What happened? All right, here we go. Uh, it's, it's talk like a pirate. It is not talk like a pirate day. Is it? Chat, is it? Is it talk like a pirate day? How you doing there? It's Litany and Clark Joe. Good to see you. Let me know. I don't, I don't think it is. Um, Nice. Nice. Uh, that's frightfully annoying. My, um, uh, let me know. One second, one second. I'm going to put this up here just in case so that I can still. S uh, that'll do all right who did that all right ah it was september 19th it's talk like a fritz day now that's what i thought they were wrong they were wrong so my overlay my my um my teleprompter doesn't look like it's running i'm gonna have to go get that running but let's head over to the other desk get things started when we get over there yeah look at that all right back over here hello hello uh what happened here let's see can we get that running again yes all right i can see the chat room now how you doing there, chat room? All right. Um, I don't need this up here, which would have been frightfully annoying. Just in case it's over there. All right. Just in case. In case we lose something. All right. So authentication and authorization. Um, let me, yeah. I'm going to open this in Visual Studio Code so we can get in and take a look here. What do you mean you can't find the file? It was right there. Um, I want to be down in there. That read me. Here we go. All 
All right. Authentication and authorization. So. Merge these. Thank you. So when we talk about authentication and authorization, there are two pieces that we have to configure separately inside of inside the application. And let me move that. There we go. So we need to configure how you get logged in, and then we need to configure how you get authorized, how you are how we determine how to grant you capabilities to interact with the application. So we do this through a, a library that's available to us in .NET called Identity. And we're gonna go through and add those identity components to our project. And there's a great series of content, series of articles over here on the... Thanks. Um, yes, I, I know over here on the doc site about scaffolding the identity objects, getting things configured. There is an entire section here about security and identity, okay? That's gonna answer all kinds of questions you might have about different ways that you want to configure for folks to be able to log in. At the very least, you need to install the components to get started. Some of the other things that I'm going to be doing as far as configuring my own local database, configuring um, configuring the various roles and things, they might be coming in from your other provider. You might be getting it from Active Directory or other places. That's fine. For our purposes, we're creating our own and we're going to go through and, and enable and do checks on those to determine whether or not you're allowed access. So... But agreed, David uh, on YouTube says, golden rule, never ever roll your own, never write your own security provider. Don't do that. There are so many people who have spent literally their entire job building, configuring, and making sure this works, and then spending time making sure it's still secured as new hacks come out as new vulnerabilities are deployed and they go through and fix and maintain stuff like this all the time don't right roll your own because you're becoming a target all right so that's some my my statement about that let's add those identity components to our project now i've already got them added to the version that I have sitting here in 1209. I'm gonna actually back up out of this. Um, I'm going to, how do we wanna do this? Let me do this to the 1208 version. So I'm gonna drop into 1208 and we're gonna, we're gonna modify the version here. All the changes that were already sitting in 1209, right? 1209, this is the uh, second time through on season two, ninth episode. Um, okay. So inside here, I'm going to open this. Um, actually, let's do this. I've already got... I'm not even going to look at that one. But if I need it, it's there. So I have controllers. I have data. The json file we initially loaded from all of our database migrations are sitting here here's our database models using entity framework database context our collection items different view models that we work with so let's add those identity components to this there's a couple of command line instructions you can do this in visual studio there's tools that are all set up, that are real easy to use in Visual Studio. I'm gonna do this at the command line. I, I see the command line as the great equalizer. Everybody can do can do the, the command line tools no matter what machine, whatever, no matter what operating system you're on. So I'm gonna add the code generation design package first. This allows me to generate code that's going to be used inside my project. So I'm just going to paste. Come here. There we go. So we're just going to add that package. It's going to run through, install all the things. 
dun, 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 dun. look at all the package good now that I can generate code I'm going to put down the ASP.NET code generator and this has all the templates necessary to add identity um, pages forms into my ASP.NET application so and I happen to already have it installed good next we're going to add the packages appropriate for connecting into and using identity so we need code generation design entity framework design because it, it generates code at design time design time is what we call when you're writing code uh, identity for entity framework core the identity user interface uh, entity framework core SQL server it has some things in it that that are common that we need across these and our entity framework tools so I'm just gonna copy that and I can paste it in here yes and it's going to execute each one of them one at a time on the console while that's going let me answer this question from Chris on Twitch am I gonna have a session on deployment of web apps uh, deployment to Azure um, I'll cover that briefly next time while we do our wrap-up um, I want folks to be able to see some of the different places you can put applications on Azure whether it's app service or static web apps or uh, a virtual machine um, there's a bunch of different places that you can put applications to run on Azure so you can in container apps lots of great ways you can deploy all right so there it is it's all configured with those items um, and we can see the list of scaffolder options by running this and it'll show me Ta -da! here's all the options that I can execute to scaffold and add identity into my project okay more on this in a minute no I didn't say more on but more on this yes which playlist will this video be in it'll be in the C sharp with C sharp Fritz YouTube playlist no sound on Twitch can I get verification on that that there's no sound on Twitch it's litany has sound thank you um, all right so I'm going to add using the default user interface code generator identity use default UI I'm just scrolling down that page that I have linked at the top of the documentation add the identity components that link and I'm just following the .NET Core CLI instructions. So um, I'm going to scaffold this. Uh, uh, wait, I'm sorry. This one, we already did those. All right. So let's add that. Now this is going to add the minimum number of files to the project. We need to move some things around to allow it to be able to um, build properly, route properly because we've customized some things at this point we need to make sure that it reaches in and puts them down in places that are appropriate the scaffold will put things down in places that are appropriate for our application and it, it does its best to place them appropriately so let's take a look make some adjustments and get this working all right um and we're going to do the migrations next but this won't build right now, right? So um, let's do this. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna split. Um, and over here, I'm going to, nah, don't split it that way. No, don't split it that way, split it this way. So you can see it down there. All right, so back over to, oh, I gotta go through. CD dev C sharp with uh, sessions season two. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, do -do this good. All right. Um, I'm not in. Why does it say I'm in that branch? Because that's not the branch I'm on. Oh, uh, that's the file. That's the folder I'm in. I'm good there. Okay. 
All right. Um, let me run the application at this point. So we're going to build, and it worked. It worked, but it didn't work. Let me show you. Um, up here, it created an area, and it put a, a context. This is the default database context that it creates for us. So, right, it's, it's telling us, here's where we're going to create and maintain users and roles and verify folks with logins using this database context. And the configuration for this, not that real, is inserted into program down here. And it put... Where'd it go? It put these lines. Now, for my application, this doesn't make sense. It added another database con... I have my database context here, but it created another one down here for my collection site DB context. Where is it? My collection site. There it is. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Where is it? It's here somewhere. I saw it. Um, no, that that's the thing right there. Okay. So it added this and it's maintaining a separate context. So now it's looking for two databases. And that's okay. You may want two different databases for where your user information for your application is. In, in the application that I'm building on my Twitch channel, I have two separate databases. I have a database for my users and I have a database for my data. They're sitting on the same machine, but they're separated. I've got a physical disconnect. I can move them to different locations. I can change providers so that they don't touch each other. Keeping that isolation protects a little bit from being able to jump across there. Uh, is this kind of identity server provider? We're not using identity server, but identity server would sit on top of this. This is the data provider. So, I don't want this. I don't want two of these contexts running around here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back over into this. My collections, my collection site identity DB context. That's a mouthful. And I'm going to grab this identity DB context that it inherits from. See, it doesn't actually do anything in here, right? We've got a just a default on model creating that's doing nothing and we've got a top here that's constructing and not doing anything so let's get rid of this thing we don't need it right so i'm just going to delete that yes move it to the recycle bin be gone i'm going over here to my collection context where i was doing all the rest of the work for creating and storing my hat items right there's my collection items objects and i'm going to change this instead of going to db context I'm going to change it to identity db context. So what I've done, identity db context is a entity framework context that has additional information layered on top of it for all of our user and role information. And we're telling it, here's the type of user object we have. It's an identity user. And an identity user is the default, now we're not, I can't jump to the definition, but it is the default user object that comes with, um, I, with the identity platform. Now, I can change that, I can extend that, I can make that more interesting, more complex, add additional features to that if I needed to. I'm not going to right now, but if I did change it, I could write another, I, I could write another class, right? Uh, my user object inherit from identity user and I could add other features onto this like birth date right um, I'm, I'm clearly extending I'm making a more complex user and I'm adding the ability to record with that user information their birth date 
Is that a part of our security sensitive information that we need for authentication or authorization? It might be if you're working in some sort of a application that needs to verify age for folks to have access to different things. In my part of the world, we need to be 21 before we're allowed access to purchase alcohol. So maybe we want to do a birth date check before somebody's allowed access to the alcohol section of the website. Maybe we need to do uh, right other checks around access to tobacco products, right? Or other access to gambling capabilities. We, we need to do birth date checks in various parts of the world before you're allowed access. So I can add that in and I can change the type of the user here to now my user. And now my user object that's saved to the database has that additional information. There's other places where you need to replace and update that in the user interface. But for now, I'm just gonna leave this the way it is with identity user. Um, Yes, the login pages are just there. Where does the original DB context go? So identity DB context, like I mentioned, is a layer on top of, it. it's an abstraction on top of DB context. So this is a database context, but it has that extra information put on top about the users and security that we're going to be working with inside the application. So by merging that together, now I need to go back over to my program and I no longer have my collection site identity DB context. Now it's just my collection context. I've consolidated to one provider, okay? So swap that out. Let me verify that it builds. So I'll just rebuild real quick there. And, uh, no. Areas does not exist in the in the website. Uh oh. Um, I know what this is. So I have an extra here. This class, this using statement, we don't have those things anymore because that class is gone. Um, and I'm still not there. Typer name, space name, identity, DB context. I'm missing a using statement now here. You're not gonna give me that using statement, huh? Reload the window. And don't make me go to my, my other demo. Don't make me go to my other demo. You are, you're gonna make me go to my other demo. You make me sad. Nope. It should be um, prompting me. I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure why it's not picking that up. Collection context 634, yeah, right there. Um, because it, yeah. All right, we're gonna jump over to full Visual Studio then. Because it's just not finding it for me. And I was working in 1208 because I'm extending this. What you see in 1209 is the output of the demo here today. So, um, thanks. Got all these other things open. Yep, close all the tabs. And we're going to go into... Okay. Jump over to there, and this should tell me... There's my using. And there, I need that using, good. So using the identity and identity framework core, with those both in, now this should build. There we go. Good. Now I can go back to the next piece that we need to do. We need to actually build and put place in our database for all of our user information to land. So we have some migration information. We did this back when we talked about Entity Framework Core, we're gonna create a schema. We're gonna create location for that to land. So build succeeded. Yes, the tools are need to be updated. There we go. And we'll update the database and it will actually write into the database those tables and things that we need in order to 
save, persist, and interact with users who have access to this website. Manipulate with this data, show us how to print with this value using view bag. I'm sorry, what? I, I need some more context there. I'm not quite sure what you're asking, Jason. Um, okay, so now I've got my location on disk where the database is going to interact with. And this could be, I'm using, um, I'm using my, uh, not my SQL, SQL light here, but you could use any other entity framework supported database, right? You could use my SQL, Postgres, SQL server, Oracle, your choice, all kinds of databases available. Uh, when's it going to be my next live stream? I'm, I'm streaming right now. I'll be streaming tomorrow over on Twitch. Um, okay, back over to... Um, so I've got those. We need to put in the layout next. So check this out. We have a partial class that's been added into our project. And a partial class, you remember we did this with, a, with the card partial to show our collection items. There was one that was added as part of the scaffolding here right there, it's called login partial. And when you take a look at this, it contains the information to generate a login link and to also show who's logged in. So we need to put this into our application. So I'm gonna put this into the layout right next to our other navigation links here. So after this, I will add partial uh, what is it? Uh, right, it's uh, name. That's, I keep getting the various syntaxes confused between the various ASP.NET and Blazor components. Um, all right. So now with that added in, let's go back over to here. And I should be able to .NET watch and see the application build and, and show a, a login uh, link for us. So here it is building. Come on. There we go. Start it. Right, make sure I didn't, I, I open that back up. I wanna make sure I still have my, my script that I was going through. Come on, there it goes. Now I've got two of them, because one's not enough. Yes, welcome to .NET Coding with Fritz, absolutely. So back to here. So this is all in the readme. Come on, finish loading. I have another machine that I'm going to be deploying and using next week for when we're coding over here. That's a little bit faster and uh, is rebuilt that we're going to be using here. Um, show me that content. This one. Cool. Um, nope, that's not the right one. Pardon me. This one. All right, so we did .NET, uh, .NET run, we put the login partial. Yes, we're gonna talk about. So now, see up here, I have I have register and login links that were added. That's my login partial. So I can now go and register and it will, it, it should, oh no, it's not getting me through. And this is a little bit that we need to tune here. See over here, it says area equals identity. It doesn't have the routing configured right. And I ran into this, and you might run into this also when you add authentication into an application. I'm gonna scroll down here, and you see where it adds authentication and then authorization? Way down here, just before it did map hub, map controller route. I need to actually put this right after routing. way up here right after routing and 
I also need to map, not controller route, map razor pages. Now, if we go back to our .NET watch, I'm gonna force it to restart. I changed the program. I changed the way that the application starts. So I need to restart it. Um, you need to answer to my, I need answer to my next question. Yes, I am using SQLite, but you still need to add SQL Server package. Yes, you do. There's there's tools that are in the SQL Server package that are need to be referenced and used. So, I'm sorry, Jason, I'm sorry. I, I'm not understanding your question. So, now when I refresh and I mouse over and I go to register, now you see it goes to slash identity slash account slash register. It's, it's properly seeing that route is available. So, okay. Nice and white screen here. Let me create a new account. I'm going to put this at my Jeff at JeffreyFritz.com account. I will create a really difficult password for no one to guess here. And see, I, I didn't even get it right. And register. And now I'm registered. Now, by default, this is configured so that It'll send an email to folks to say, hey, you created a new account here, authenticate that you have an account, but I'm not going to wire up to an email provider. I'm just gonna click through. There's instructions there for how to create an email provider so that your website can use SendGrid or some other service to send messages out about, hey, you need to be logged in and, and you created an account, here's how to get logged in. So I'll create, I'll go to log in, I'll key in my email, there it is. No, I, that, thank you. And now I'm logged in and hello, Jeff at jeffreyfritz.com. I'm logged in and now I have access to do things on the site, but I haven't actually configured anything to constrain what I'm doing on the site. And I've also been able to key in whatever I want for my password. So what if you wanna change the password requirements? Or what if what if you want to be able to log in with GitHub was the other question. And somebody also else also mentioned, what if I wanna do two-factor authentication, right? I wanna be able to use my phone to, to bring up a, a number there that you have to scan in order to, you need to key in in order to log in. Let's talk about the two-factor authentication bit first. Then we'll add in GitHub as a login. Um, and then we'll start requiring capability to get through here. What service do I recommend for sending emails in the .NET application? Asks Anders Nielsen over there on YouTube. Uh, Anders, I'm a big fan of SendGrid. Um, the folks at Twilio manage SendGrid. Um, lots of great features there so you can um, track and, and and see how your uh, how your emails have been received and, and handled well. I've also used Mailgun in the past. Um, I use that for my feedback site for the ClipTalk application. I use Mailgun.com, but SendGrid is what I prefer. They didn't have a configuration for SendGrid for the tool that I'm using for that for the ClipTalk feedback site. So I, I'm just using Mailgun, but you have options. What does the Badger on YouTube asks, what does the two-factor authentication partial, which has the QR code support? Yes, why is the QR code part not part of DI? Because it's a JavaScript library that that is elsewhere that we want you to grab, download, and install instead of us generating and deploying it. Just here, there's a QR code generation thing. Go grab that and use it. So that way we're not um, delivering it. You can use your favorite deployment mechanism to go get it. So let's let's do that. Let me go and do the two-factor. Uh, two-factor. Yeah, two-factor authentication. Here we go. So there's instructions um, for the QR code, but we're going to scaffold and add... Uh, Yeah, in scaffold identity. Come here. Come here. I don't. Why is that taking so long to navigate?
right? Two factor, yes. So I'm adding files. Da, 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 da. Yes. No, no, no. Come here. There's a uh, series of instructions down here and there's all kinds of files you can add to your project. But we are going to add, no, pardon me. Yeah. We're not doing the cross, uh, 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 the uh, uh, cross-site scripting. I'm not gonna do that piece in here. Darn it, where is, um, come here. No, password configuration, disabling pages. Um, it's this, but we're going to be doing something different. No, hmm. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm trying to remember where it is. Not the model, it's in the screens. But it's it's that same set of instructions. Here we go. Um, so I want to list the files that we can possibly get. So I'll pass dash dash files. And it should tell me Oh, list files is the one I want. Because I want to list, here's the files that we can do. Um, there we go. So I want, I want the two-factor authentication. Manage two-factor authentication. See it right there? We're going to add that. So I'm going to say files, account, uh, manage, two-factor, authentic. I know this is now behind me, but trust me, I'm typing it correctly. Building the project, and it'll, it'll put these files into it that we can work with. Yes, I know, things don't exist. There we go. So check this out. Our .NET watch up top is kind of, it, it, it's upset, it's, it, it's, it, it's trembling here. Ah, what do I do, what do I do? I don't know what this is. No problem. We're gonna rebuild and we're gonna get this running. Um, so we need to go into, we're gonna go up here, cancel that. I'm gonna go over to full Visual Studio and we'll see there's now inside areas identity pages account manage oh yeah look at all this stuff look at all this good stuff right all this stuff is in here let me just make sure we can dot net build good everything built so if i dot net watch now right so i've kicked that off um and we'll, right, so if I click on the hello up there, now I'm into the manage site. All of these pages are sitting inside of a Razor class library. They're compiled up and they're being extracted and served to you. But I've added the two-factor authentication capability and now I can add an authenticator to this. Now, if you want to put a QR code, there's a link here that says, here's how to go do the QR code. But go into your app and you key in this string and now you're able to have a two-factor two authentication running off your phone. The QR code is really what a lot of folks want because it makes it so easy for folks to be able to get, get logged in with, with uh, two-factor authentication. So I'm gonna go, go over here and grab the QR code JS library. Um, I'm just going to grab the zip file for that. Thank you. Open that up. And there it is. QR. I can also grab the min.js. 
I'll grab both of those. Um, go over here. And JS. Uh, really, I should put it in a lib folder, shouldn't I? Right. And I can paste them. Um, open that folder. There they are. Okay. So now I need that to be on the page. So the bit that we're told is to go into the enable authenticator CSHTML. Uh, and we need to locate scripts and add that. Yeah. Okay. I should have an enable authenticator over here, right? Areas, account, two-factor authentication. Um, we didn't get enable authenticator. We need... Hang on. It's still really big. Enable Authenticator. And we'll get that file written. Come on. Um, <laughs> uh, that's fine. It's still trying to put this thing here that we're not using. Um, oh! Oh! It didn't. Fine, do it again. Force it. Yeah, no NPM. Why? Just uh, I'm just grabbing this one file. I could certainly go grab it. Um, this is coming out of program. Do, 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 do. Yep, goodbye. One more time. <sighs> Modified program, see, and this isn't gonna work because it put that back in there, get rid of that. That's fine. We're good. Um, but, there's Enable Authenticator. Okay. So, let's finish putting this piece in here. Um, locate the script section at the end, and we're gonna do await HTML partial async on the validation. Uh, now, it's doing it net with, a, with the partial component helper there. That's fine. Um, and it wants me to create a little QR JavaScript file here to do this. Fine. Um, so I will write a little JavaScript file for that. Here, JavaScript, create a new file. So H the HTML partial async is the old way we used to do things. Now we can just use the component helper to get to jump right through. So I will call this like they recommended, QRJS. Paste in the code they recommended, save it. Go back over and they want me to put this into um, down at the bottom with the other scripts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grab that back into here. So I'm not in lib QR code, it's, I called it QR code, QR code. So you could see it already reloaded in the background. Mm, something didn't, I didn't, there's something I missed there. But 
You can certainly use NPM to go get it if you want, but then you got to copy it from here from the NPM folders over, and that can be annoying. There's the QR code. So now I can scan the QR code with my phone app, right, wherever it might be. And now I've got an authentication over there for my application to be able to log in and interact to do my thing. Um, I thought the QRJS, I thought it, I thought there was a way to specify the name. I don't see it there. Um, yeah, I don't. There is a way to specify the name. I don't remember how to do it off the top of my head. So it appears with that name. I put it in the Signora folder. No, I didn't. I put it next to the Signora folder right there. And I put QR code the JavaScript file right there. Um, how there, how are you doing there, Pablo? Is it possible to integrate with ADFS? Yes. That's, a, and I'm going to go back to kind of the disclaimer I made earlier. The links that I've, I've given for this section of the documentation, there is in, in, directions for Windows authentication, directions for Azure Active Directory, all kinds of things right here linked out of the um, the notes at the top of the top of the session that we're going through today. So um, I, I can't go through and cover all the different things, but I want to make sure that you know it's possible. There are open source providers for all kinds of different services that you may want to connect to. I really like this directory over here, ASP.NET Security OAuth Providers, because there's literally connections for just about every service that you may want folks to be able to log in with to your website. Really cool. You want folks to be able to log in with PayPal? There it is. And there's documentation for how to do it. I'm going to show you real quick how to do GitHub. Okay. So I'm going to navigate through to that. I'm also going to go through the docs over here and drop down to GitHub. So I'm on the GitHub docs page. There's a client ID and a client secret that you're going to have. And we also have a package to add. Now, let me show you. Inside my application, I'm going to log out up here. When I click log in again, you see it says use another service to log in and there's kind of nothing here. Um, as we add this capability. So I just pasted that install script that NuGet gave me. That's done. Go ahead and restart that. And it doesn't get me. What? Uh, yeah. Oh, it created a backup. Uh, that's fine. There it goes. Just doing that build, just adding that package. Doesn't put it over here yet. We actually need to configure the thing. This is for beginners. Um... These folks call me at the worst time. Um, okay, so let's go. We're going to do this piece next. Let's go finish configuring that GitHub account. So I need to get configuration. I need to get an account on GitHub to be able to log in with and authenticate as. So I'm going to. Yes, I, I know. Thank you, Edge. I believe I'm logged in on this one. No, I'm not. And now I need my authentication code. So yeah, now I've got to do my two-factor authentication for this so I can do my two-factor authentication. <sighs> All right. 
So now I can go settings for me and I can create, I believe it's GitHub apps, right? I believe that's where it is. No, I was wrong. There's a link to the documentation next to each one of these for that particular provider. So I need to create an OAuth app. Yes, yes, yes. Settings and then OAuth apps. It's not there. Oh wait, that's on that repository. That settings. Developer settings, OAuth apps. Look, other ones that I've created. Application name, we're gonna call this uh, collection website. Local host, I think it's something like that, right? Yeah, 7222. Uh, application description, uh, test website. Uh, website, uh, used in C-sharp with C-sharp frets, okay? Callback URL. This is the one thing that nobody gets right. So, where'd it go? Back over here, if you look at Uh, I always get this wrong. The callback URL. No, I always get it wrong. It's going to be localhost. It's like sign in GitHub. I think that's what it is. Uh, no, I'm not listing the application. I own this application. There's my client ID. Now I can add this. Check this out. So, I had the instructions up. Where'd they go? Go to the instructions. There it is. So we say services add authentication. Builder, services, add auth. Uh, it's inside yeah I should be able to say dot add github now um, yep options options thank you options client ID equals this now I would probably pull it from configuration um, <laughs> options client secret and I'm going to grab and I don't care that folks see my client secret it's over in here yes generate a new client secret there it is copy it and copied in, because I'm gonna delete this application. I need to put in add authentication. Yeah, I add authentication. Um, not sure why that isn't finding. I forgot to send. Because I added GitHub, it should have picked that up. I think it got it that time. Um, build probably failed. That should have worked. I'm going to try to put that again. I didn't think it went inside of it. I thought it went next to it. 
not there. It is here. Yeah, add authentication options and then add GitHub off of services. Yeah, that should have built. There it goes. I'm guessing because I had I had watch running. So, okay, that's built included I've added in the reference to GitHub. So now my hat collection, I'm going to click log in and now I have GitHub available to me. I also, no, don't do LastPass. Don't give away the ghost here. When I log in, hey. And I click over here. There's an external logins option and I can also connect that other provider. So I'll connect my GitHub account and sure. Remember the password, Fritz, and my two-factor authentication to GitHub is... <laughs> URI mismatch. Yes, okay. So this is, I went to the wrong place. Um, on the return. Yeah. The external login is supposed to go. I, I, it's not clear here in their documentation. Um, what the return URI is. Shoot. Samples. Yeah. I, I get this wrong all the time. The format for that, thank you. Um, no, no, no. Come here, you. Anyone going to NDC Oslo? I am not going to NDC Oslo. I'm actually, I'm not going to too many more in-person events. It's, um, it's difficult, it's a pain in the neck. Travel is very costly right now. Come on, where's the format for this? Um, slash sign in dash. Where'd it go? I'm on this one. No. Sla slash sign in dash. Okay. Try that one more time. Give me that login link. This one. Right, so back over here, external logins, GitHub. Yes, authorize. There it is. Sign in dash and then the provider name and now it's connected and I can log in with GitHub to use my application. So login. GitHub, I'm already logged in, boom, I'm in, and it has that up there. Awesome, all right, we got that working. We can log in now with GitHub. We saw how to turn on two-factor authentication. Um, let's actually start authorizing access to some things. Let me just scroll through and catch up on a couple of messages here. 
in chat. Um, modifying them to add that QR script was a pain. Yes, now that you can generate it, it's pretty easy to do. Um, you're busy upgrading to .NET 6, says Brand Bradfield Phillips. Um, is Visual Studio 2019 compatible? No, you need to be on 2022. Um, how much time is left to the end of the stream? About 10 minutes. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Fall in with a question here. Can you please clarify? Um, I, I... I know if a class is sealed, it'll gain some performance. Can you please make it clear when it may? No, I'm not going to go into that. That's way off topic right now. Sorry. Um, how would I secure my customer API now that the token from GitHub? Um, put it, You would put it into um, a key vault, like Azure Key Vault. You could put it into configuration options so that it's passed in from your web server in memory. Um, I, I've clearly hard-coded it here, but I could certainly get that from, from configuration, right? Instead of hard-coding it, I could say uh, builder services uh, configuration... Uh, or is it just builder.configuration? Yeah. Right. Um, GitHub client secret. Get it from there. That way, if it's an environment variable, if it's an Azure key vault, if it's in a couple different places, it'll be loaded up and it's not in your code. But for this, just to make it simple, it's hard coded right there. Um... Um, I'm working on the Pittsburgh thing. It is very much happening. Um, we have a sponsor. We are nailing down a facility. We're working that out. Fuel Snable went to a conference in Gothenburg, but it's kind of next door from here. Yeah, for me to travel to Europe, to anywhere outside the United States, not happening. I, the, the budget, the cost, and not to mention the consideration for, for international health concerns, not worth it. Um, no. For Jot, dear Lord, no. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. you're new here? Well, welcome. Uh, why do we use render body? Why do we, Jason, you, you've asked that question several times. That's the syntax. That That's the syntax. That's where we're putting the content of our pages. It gets rendered into that. Um, you use test driven for our unit test once we upgrade to Visual Studio 2022. What can I use to replace that? It come, there's unit testing built into Visual Studio 2022 that you'll get. All right, I've got seven minutes left. Let me show you how to do authorization next. So we added authentication. Let's add authorization. So I can say uh, builder services add authorization. And this turns on the ability for us to say, is somebody granted access to this thing? So I can now go through and inside my code, verify that folks are allowed to have access to things. So I can, just like we did with Razor Pages, I can go into my controller. Let's go to my collection items controller. And I can go down here to, let's say, edit. All right, turn that off. Uh, I'm gonna pass on create let's do it on edit and I can add a authorize attribute here and it says you just the authorize attribute says you must be logged in in order to be able to access this page so I'll save that and come on cool um, now, when I click through to edit, I'm allowed to edit because I'm logged in, but if I log out and I click edit, you have to log in. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're allowed access to this. Go log in. And I can also then add other policies that inspect and go after claims that correspond with the user to inspect and, and tell if, it well, decide are you allowed to have access to this? We can also do a role inspection here. So inside my authorize attribute, I can specify the name of a policy 
and I can also specify the names of roles that somebody must belong to in order to gain access. So I could say roles equals admin, and you must be in a member of the admin role in order to have access. Now, role management happens somewhere else. That happened, That's something that you need to write, you need to manage, and there's a role manager object that you can use to insert and remove folks from different roles inside your application. And really, a role is just a, it's a string that corresponds to a series of, of claims, right? And a claim is, is a, a key value relationship that allows you to inspect various security appropriate security concerns around a user and determine are they allowed to use this so claims might be things like um works in the north american region works in the europe region right works in, in if i need to check a claim and for somebody to have access to be able to edit certain capabilities they must be in the north american region okay we can enforce that through a policy our policies are defined back in the program file when we say add authorization we can start to add policy information by saying options add policy and i can define a policy now so i can give it a name um can edit and now I can provide, well, what are the instructions? What are the things we need to enforce around that policy to allow you to edit? So I can say, well, you can edit if you belong to a particular role. If you're an authenticated user, you're allowed to edit. I can define all of those things right here. I can even add claims or custom requirements. I can even write some code to inspect the user get information back about that and return a true false flag. Are they granted access? Are they not? And it uses an I requirement, um, I authorization requirement interface to define a class that will inspect that user and bring back information. So um, let's call this new can edit requirement. Okay. And I can generate that class. I'll put it into a new file. And, uh, nope. What don't we like there? Yes, it should have. I, right, make sure I get the thing right. I authorization requirement. Authorization requirement. Put a using statement on that, and I can implement this. Come on, implement it. No, uh, because I put it on the wrong place. Should go there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Come on. There's a signature here that I want, and it's not giving it to me. Come on. Yes, I, I know. It's not showing me the signature there that I want. Nice. There's a couple methods that, that you can implement in there that will do the inspection, and I don't have them off the top of my head. The docs have a link to that. I'm gonna come back to the questions in just a second. But for the purposes of this, just to get this working, I'm gonna say, require authenticated user I'll let that restart and I can still run into this issue when I click through to edit and it wants me to log in fine I'm going to log in actually I just click the github button Fritz I don't have access to this resource yes I do um, require authenticated user um, where to go back to controller because I'm not a member of that role. If I change that to policy can edit, I've got an equals rebuilds 
and back over here, click edit, and now I get through. Last thing that I want to show you is you can inject into your views an auth authentication service. Um, and it is uh, item card. You're not going to find that for me, are you? There it is. I've already got this written over here. You know what? Let's just jump to the final version. Because I'm running out of time. There it is. Grab those two. So I authorization service and I can go down here and I can wrap this and say if and I called it auth service and now I can check are you authorized and I can specify first the user <clears throat> and then the policy to evaluate but I can pass in the name of that policy can edit right and I want to wait that and I could say if it succeeded then you do get the edit button so I will log out Go ahead, rebuild. And that edit button should disappear. Uh, come on. Ah, uh, come on. Authorize async user can edit and... Why didn't that go away? I have exactly that code. User can edit succeeded. And it even restarted. I don't know why it's not hiding it. The version that I have on 12.09 which is the same thing that we've been going through. Is there a way to debug Razor? Yes. You can use Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code and attach the debugger to the server and you'll be able to see it running. Mm -hmm. And there it is, they're removed. So. And that's just doing an if, is this user authorized to this policy and that authorization succeeded, then they're allowed through. And I'll show you what that policy looks like. Uh, not that one. There it is. So options add policy. Can edit policy require authenticated user and it lets you through. So log in, yeah, see. And now I get the buttons because I'm logged in, okay? All this source code is available online on the GitHub repository. Let me head over back to the main screen. Let's wrap things up. I'm a little bit over on time. All right. <sighs> we got through it. We got all the things working there. I feel good about it. Um, is there a good tutorial to implement Azure Key Vault using .NET 6? Um, I don't have one off the top of my head. I know we have tutorials about how to implement it. It's not hard. Um, so, um, yeah, there's something there. 
that you can do that. Uh, thanks, Algebra. Glad you enjoyed the music. Uh, is there perhaps additional plugins you need to install for the use of Visual Studio 2022 in unit tests? Nope. It it's it's comes with it. Um, why was the uh, GitHub login missing? I I didn't include the GitHub login in that version of the website. Um, but it would pop up if uh, if it was included over there. You're welcome, Megzia. Thank you so much. Uh, can we use the same policy as decorator over some controllers method? That's what I did. You can add it over the entire controller and, and force it there. Um, fantastic. All right, I am going to make sure that I get that code committed. Well, the code is already committed. Um, I'll get it merged and you'll be able to see it out there on um, out there on the GitHub repository. Is there any issue if you return action result instead of via action result? No, you can do that just fine. Thank you. It, it's just a question of unit testing. You're not going to be able to return the action result when you're unit testing. Um, so thank you so much, friends, for tuning in. I really appreciate you joining me. But it's time for me to call it a day. I need to move on, get over to some meetings. We're planning for .NET Conf coming up in November, the launch of .NET 7. We've got 80 sessions coming for you. We're, we're reviewing, planning, taking a look at what's what are the next steps there. We've got folks actively working on getting all that stuff ready for you. I hope you tune in with me November 8, 9, and 10 coming up. Um, it's going to be a fantastic uh, three days of content for you uh, on both of these channels you're watching right now. YouTube.com slash .net, Twitch.tv slash Visual Studios. You'll find it over there. I've made using policy so simple. That's the goal. That's the goal. Um, thank you so much, all of you that are watching on YouTube. I've got lots of great videos here. There's lots of great videos from the .NET team. Check them out. Make sure you check out the other videos in this series, in the playlist, C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. And those of you that are watching on Twitch, let's get ready for a raid. Let's raid. Let's go see who's streaming on the big Twitch TV network that we can get you connected with, that we can set up and, and send everybody to go join that's doing something cool. Taking a look around the horn, who else is streaming out there that would be fun to connect with? I am going to get you in to go see. Let's get you over to our friend Lana Lux, who's working, she's writing a game. She's an independent game developer. We're gonna get you over to go see Lana. Thank you so much, friends, for tuning in. I really appreciate you joining me. I hope you learned something, and I hope you check out the rest of the source code, the rest of the demos from this video series. And I hope you come back tomorrow over on twitch.tv slash c fritz where I'll be writing some Blazor code, building on Azure, and having a great time with some c -sharp content. But for now, get ready to say hi to my friend, Lana Lux. And uh, she's building a, a video game all by herself called, it's called Stream, building it with Unity, building it with C Sharp. It's another place that you can use your .NET skills. Check it out. We're going to go see her now. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week. Take care.